Welcome to Concordia Theological Seminary and our lectionary podcast. Today we will be looking at uh, the Old Testament text. This is for Holy Trinity Sunday. And the Old Testament text for Holy Trinity Sunday will be Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 to 8. Now there's a reason why this text is chosen for Holy Trinity Sunday. And it's this rare triad uh, verse here, the Kadosh, the Kadosh, Kadosh. So we'll be looking at that a little bit more here in a bit. But the this idea here, I'm sorry, Kadosh, Kadosh, Kadosh. This threefold triad is very unusual to see this in, in the uh, Old Testament. You get a lot of doublets, but not a lot of uh, triads. That's kind of unusual. And the early church considered this to be a Trinitarian formula. However, and I would agree with that, by the way, however, during the Arian controversy, they stepped away from that use as Arius was, uh, well, let's say he was using the text against them uh, as he supported his own heretical position. It took a while, but the church has come back, returned to that Trinitarian interpretation, and thus it's in the pericopal system for Holy Trinity Sunday. Now, since this text sets up the, the call, really maybe more properly to say the sending of the prophet Isaiah, it's curious why it takes place so late in the book. Chapter 6, kind of late for the call, uh, especially um, when you consider all of the information and even, and even prophecy that's already preceded Isaiah's call. And this has caused a great deal of discussion among Old Testament exegetes over the years. Now, some of them would suggest that there's just a lack of chronological order going on here. Others have posited that this uh, indicates uh, a pre-call ministry of Isaiah. And there's others who see uh, chapter 6 then as a renewal of this call of Isaiah, which he received earlier. My personal opinion on this is that we, the reader, the hearer, that we are being brought into the context of the situation, the situation in which um, Isaiah is being called. Judah is experiencing one of the most peaceful, most prosperous times since King Solomon. However, that calm situation is, uh, I would say it has dulled the hearts of the people adversely affected their faithfulness. They're going through the motions, but they're really, their hearts have drifted from the Lord. And so chapters 1 through 5 that precede this then give us a clear picture of that reality. So when Isaiah does receive his call, his sending by the Lord to be his prophet, to be his mouthpiece to the people of Israel, the southern kingdom of Judah especially, we can already see the challenge of what he's being called into. But really, regardless of the reason for this positioning late here in the text, uh, we should definitely see this uh, position of the text as being original and intentional to the book of Isaiah. Another interesting discussion point concerning this text is its location. Where does this actual... Uh, event take place. Verse 1 uses that word, hekal. We see it here, the ha hekal, the temple. But the question really becomes, which temple? Now, does Isaiah find himself in the Holy of Holies in Jerusalem? Or is this taking place in the um, heavenly temple, you know, in the courts of heaven. Well, that's a, a question that keeps being discussed over and over. And perhaps maybe we might even answer the, that as yes, maybe both. Because the Hebrews, understanding the Hebrews are that these two things are really inseparable realities. They don't really think of them as totally being unrelated. In fact, they are very related. Uh, 
and I think that would be my personal understanding, certainly. And certainly the more important reality described in the text, as we'll be looking at it here, is Isaiah finds himself in the presence of God, the living God, the Holy One. It's a terrifying situation for Isaiah because Isaiah knows full well that the unholy cannot endure the presence of the Holy One. It's a very dangerous thing, so we'll look at that more closely as we progress through this text. So beginning here in verse 1, the Bishnamoth. Kind of interesting, this phrase. Isaiah is using the death, the date of a death, for instance, of in this case the king, King Uzziah, as you see, Uzziah over here. The king Uzziah, he's using the date of a king, the death of a king rather, to kind of help us to date his, his call here. Uh, no other prophet in Scripture does this. And Isaiah does it twice. If you go to chapter 14, verse 28, you'll see it again. It'll be in the year that King Ahaz died. Again, Isaiah using the death of the king to um, set up things. And it may very well be that Isaiah does this because he sees King Uzziah's death as being an indictment or perhaps as a symbol of the nation of Judah and her unfaithfulness. And if you need any more information on Uzziah's unfaithfulness, you can look at 2 Kings chapter 5 or, or 2 Chronicles uh, chapter 26, verse 16 and following. So in the year of King Uzziah's death. We see, it says, I saw, I saw the Lord dwelling upon the throne, the kisse. So, the wa, the wa erea eth Adonai yoshev. The yoshev here happens to be a participle form. So the idea of, of sitting there, uh, you might at first think, and again, at first blush, just this verse by itself, you might think that Isaiah is looking at or seeing the pre-incarnate Son of God. You might think this is a pre-incarnate Christ because man cannot look upon the face of God and live. However, that threefold kadosh, as we pointed out earlier, that the phrase of the seraphim, could suggest rather the presence of the entire Godhead here, the Holy Trinity. Therefore, Isaiah should be really in terror. I mean, it would not be the first time, though, that God actually breaks this his own rule about seeing him face to face. We do have examples of that elsewhere. Previous, Moses is one that comes to mind, but you also need to remember Exodus 24 when the elders, the 70 elders, went up the mount to eat in the presence of God. God's sitting there with the sapphire pavement. I mean, this really indicates more than just uh, the second person of the Godhead, but rather the whole, the whole Godhead. God makes these rules, but God sometimes sets them aside, but always for the sake of, for grace, not, uh, not against us, not for wrath, but for grace. So something to keep in mind, but it really does appear that, that Isaiah is actually in the presence of the Godhead, the Trinity. And uh, that really uh, makes this text quite unique and very interesting, no doubt. So now we have these words and pointed out before the, um, the kisse. We have the hehekal and the kisse. So we have the, the throne and the temple. And once again, this is going to, um, to give us the idea of temple, doesn't it? I mean, this, this idea, where is this taking place? you got the throne, you got in the temple. Uh, but it doesn't really answer our question, again, as to location. Because the mercy seat is considered to be the, uh, the throne and the Holy of Holies, the throne room of God in the earthly Jerusalem temple. And of course, that language also fits the description or the depiction of heaven. And then finally in this verse, we take a look at this, uh, this kind of a interesting word here. 
the Washula, which is um, from the uh, the word shul, which is kind of an unusual uh, unusual form. It's actually uh, could mean the uh, the skirt or the hem, or um, sometimes it's translated as robe, but it really should be more the idea of a portion of the robe. So maybe uh, I've seen this translation, I think it's a pretty good one. The train of his robe, you know, filled, filled the temple here. So I'd probably go with the train of the robe, but not just robe. Okay, so we move on then from there to now verse 2, the Sarah... Seraphim Omdim. Now the seraphim, you know that as, as an angelic being, but uh, literally seraphim means burning ones. And we run into the word seraph to burn. So seraphim are the burning ones standing. The burning ones standing. Well, so now we it's kind of interesting that they're standing here, but they're going to be flying around here in a few minutes at least. So um, there, there's this it's kind of an interesting uh, flip here. But the seraphim that are standing, and now we, <clears throat> excuse me, the covering, they're covering with two of their wings, they're covering feet, two covering face, <clears throat> and with the third pair then they're flying around. Now, it's interesting, the pronouns here. The pronoun really doesn't give us any information who or what, whose face, whose feet are being covered. Now, usual thought is that it's covering the seraphims, and that's probably the first thing you should think and probably your first go-to as you look at it. Um, that's the usual thought anyway. But it also actually uh, could be the feet and the face of the Holy One which might actually be how Isaiah survives his close encounter, his face-to-face -face meeting with the Lord God. I think that it's just not clear in the text, actually. And then we have the, um, here's a, a strange and unusual old form, this uh, yeofe. It's a, a, a poleo form. See if I can put that up here for you. It's a poleal form, a little unusual, but it means to fly. It comes from that uh, root. The root is actually, um, I think it's like this idea of oof. Um, it's a hollow verb here, but uh, let's see if I get this right here for you. Yeah. Get the I in on there. The oof, the poleo form means to, um, I, really more than just fly. In the poleo form anyway, you get this idea of flying back and forth, maybe flying to and fro. You know, that's this, uh, the back and forth movement comes across in the poleo form here, uh, which kind of then uh, feeds into verse 3, where they're calling to one another. So you have this, uh, the wikara ze el ze. Oops, try that again. Okay, this phrase here, literally, and he called this to this. And you should translate that then something like uh, one called to another. I think we actually have that over here. One called unto another in this translation. But this back and forth calling this to this in the Hebrew. Okay, and then what are they calling? Kadosh, Kadosh, Kadosh. This is our, our Trinitarian phrase, holy, holy, holy. Very, uh, obviously some very famous and well-known words because we use it in our liturgy and things like that. Uh, the holy, holy, holy Lord God of Sabaoth, and uh, this ongoing, um, this language of uh, following it, uh, the Melokal Haaretz Kavodo, 
especially we want to point out the Kavado, but there's a couple different ideas or ways in which you could translate that. Both of them are acceptable. You might translate it as all the earth is full of his glory. Very good. Or even a declaration or a may the earth be filled with his glory. Uh, either one's perfectly fine as far as the uh, actual Hebrew is concerned. It is interesting, though, to look at this kovadoth that I highlighted here. Um, it's his glory. Now, if you think about this in the immediate context, what we're looking at, the context of the temple, and then also the context of, of smoke that we're going to pick up in the next verse, I really think we should start to think in terms of, of glory cloud. You know, the presence of the Lord being represented in smoke, his glory, the glory cloud that uh, escorted Israel through the wilderness that, that uh, showed up at the dedication of the tabernacle and Solomon's temple. So the glory cloud is considered to be the presence of God amongst the people of Israel. Well, here we have the cloud, his glory, and his, the smoke as, as the cloud. If you, uh, just as a sideline, whenever the high priest went behind the curtain, you know, Yom Kippur, that one day out of the year, the first thing they did was they built, they had some fine incense, they put on the mercy seat and they would build a little incense fire in order to get a cloud uh, that simulated or reminded or actually performed as the glory cloud would. So um, just a little sideline there. No extra charge for that. Okay, so we go on. Now let's take a look. Let's take a look at uh, verse 4. Let me move this for you here a little bit. We'll just move that up. Whoops, wrong direction. Get you over here a little bit. There we go. I think I can get you. There we go. So as we look now at uh, verse 4, we have a couple of unusual or somewhat strange words. But the first one we take a look at here is the Wayanu, which is, uh, comes from the root nu. And it is another one of these strange hollow verbs. Uh, if I might say it's, uh, let's see, where did I put it? There we go. And uh, the new, and you can see how the, well, whatever, <laughs> that's not an X, trust me. You can see where the wow or the shoe rack has now moved into the kibbutz here. So that's just how these hollow verbs do strange and unusual things. So, um, oops. And this, uh, this is uh, kind of a, an unusual, I guess you would say, unusual form or unusual word, uh, kind of strange, but it means to, um, to shake, maybe to tremble, uh, even quake. And it should bring to mind uh, this idea of like an earthquake, you know, this, uh, the shaking of the earth. Uh, and that's, that's a very important aspect here as we consider this, this overall call of Isaiah, because uh, it has some serious ramifications in prophetic literature. So, but just before we go there, let's take a look at that other strange one here, the, the Hasafim. This is another peculiar kind of word. It, stand, it, it really comes from the root uh, suf, and... And, and that has, it, or soft, probably, probably soft, but it has this idea, it's like a threshold uh, or a sill, more properly like the, the stone that would be under the doorpost, under the, uh, right under there, and we can think of it in terms of like foundation, really. It's a foundation type stone. And so when we get this translation, then um, I would translate it, as um, different than we have up here in this one. I wouldn't say the posts of the door were moved, although you can see where they had had that idea with the, uh, the threshold being shaken. 
but it really seems to give the idea that the thresholds are the foundations for shape, shook. Um, not just the door, but the whole, the whole foundation, uh, a bigger, bigger reality, if you will. And, and it's shaking, as you can see, from the voice of the one who called. You can see the, the ha kareth from the voice of the one who called. Because it's singular, I think you need to under, I don't believe this is the, from the sound or from the holy, holy of the seraphim, but rather from the voice of the Lord God himself. Uh, the singularity here seems to indicate that. And, uh, and then you see the house was, uh, has the ashan filled with smoke. There's that smoke word we were talking about previously. Now let's unpack a little bit of that. Um, these two items of, of shaking and smoke should, um, it should bring in uh, some ideas here, some other texts, some other places in Scripture, very eschatological, quite frankly. We run into it in a lot of eschatological contexts and settings. Um, Amos, for instance, prophet Amos speaks of earthquakes and, uh, and smoke and even thick darkness on the day of the Lord. And then also in Habakkuk chapter 3, and my favorite, Haggai chapter 2, they all point to the presence of the Lord, this smoke and shaking. Um, in fact, in Haggai, the day, this day where you have the glory of the Lord will fill the temple. And remember the context here is when they dedicated the temple, the glory cloud didn't show up for Zerubbabel's temple, and that, of course, caused people some concern, especially the old men who remembered the previous temple. Well, in this case, Haggai tells them, do not be afraid, do not um, fret, that uh, the glory of the Lord that will fill this temple, and it will be greater than the glory of the Lord that filled, it'll be greater than the glory that filled the Solomon temple. And... Of course, Haggai is uh, giving us a prophecy here of when Christ himself fills the temple. But let me, well, let me point out to you something here that I think is very interesting. If we see Jesus on the cross, right, on Good Friday, after he proclaims, it is finished, then it gets dark and we get an earthquake, at least rocks are shattering, the ground is shaking, and the temple curtain is torn in two. And as we hear in, in Hebrews, that's the Son of God, Jesus, going into the temple or into the Holy of Holies to um, place his blood as the final sacrifice. So when you get all these words together, it's very, very uh, interesting to see cloud and the shaking. Uh, we see this... Uh, in many other texts, I think you can find it probably in Isaiah 25 and 6, but earthquakes and the prophets and the smoke, all these things being connected, I believe they all are foreshadowing, pointing us forward to when, when Christ accomplishes our salvation on the cross as he takes his blood into the Holy of Holies. So um, then let's go ahead and keep moving forward here. We got verse 5. And we begin with, uh, or we have this, uh, this little word here. Ori really is the uh, woe or uh, maybe alas or something like that. And then you, uh, you couple that then <clears throat> with the next one here, the nidmathi. Right here. And this um, from the... Uh, from the uh, root here, uh, meaning it has this idea, oh, what would we say? Uh, it's a nifel form, and it has that kind of idea to be, to be ruined, um, to be brought to silence and not in a good way, to be lost. 
that kind of context here, especially with the woe, with the uh, with that previous the ori. So we find that, uh, and then we have that tame. Again, another very important important thing here because it has that idea of being unclean. Now, it's extremely powerful imagery to be unclean because unclean means you're not worthy to be in the presence of the Holy One. Un being unclean keeps you out of the temple. Literally, it keeps you out of the temple. And so here's Isaiah. Of course, he's very concerned about finding himself in this place. He knows he's someplace where he should not be. And he makes it clear why. Because he's unclean. And he knows well his own uncleanness as well as that of the people amongst which he dwells. Their uncleanness. Nothing good comes out of a face-to-face -face meeting with the Holy One if you're unholy, if you're unclean. You're not worthy to be in His presence. And uh, it's interesting, I always like this. Sometimes this uh, is actually used in the Pricopal system also uh, with St. Peter. When Peter was in the boat and he came face-to-face -face with that miraculous calming of the sea and that suddenly dawned on him, who was in the boat with him, the Holy One of God, and he falls on his face to the, to the uh, deck of the boat, and he says, Depart from me, for I am a sinner. It's the same, same reaction. When you find yourself in the presence of the Holy One, uh, it's good to hide your face so you don't see his face. And so Peter's having the same reaction uh, that really Isaiah has in our text. And the Pricopal system sometimes uses this text for that as the Old Testament for that um, particular event as well. Very, very interesting and a very proper uh, connection as well. So we go on now to um, verse 6 and we get this uh, uh, Wa Yaf right here at the beginning. The Wa Yaf which means to, to fly, uh, separate from that poleo form, you know, means to fly, more fly back and forth. This just means to fly. So the idea of flying, you know, fly to me, or they then flew unto, well, they have unto me, flew to me, one of the seraphim, and they have uh, in, they have taken from the altar, keep that in mind here as we, um, as we go forward with that, because that's extremely important, the Ritz Ba here, which is a, um, a glowing coal, a hot coal, a hot ember. I think it could also be translated as a hot stone. So that, um, they bring that forward, and they're using this, uh, this uh, particular form, the Bamel Kachachim. Notice this yim ending here. That's a dual, a dual ending, and of course, tongs, <clears throat> tongs have a dual, a dual ending because, of course, there's two parts to tongs. That's why they have that. And so he took <clears throat> the uh, hot stone or the coal from the with tongs and uh, from the altar. This. The ha miz beach from the altar. Very important where the coal comes from. The um, <clears throat> when a burning coal or something fire of some sort comes from the altar, the purpose is usually to purify or to cleanse, which we see in this case. However. Otherwise, apart from that, then fire is also symbolic of God's wrath, and it destroys, brings destruction. So it's kind of important where this coal is coming from. And so this coal, this fire, then is touched to the lips of Isaiah, which, is, um, which has the effect of cleansing or atoning his mouth. And therefore, once his mouth is purified, he is made ready to, to preach, to speak 
to prophesy the word of God. Now, very interesting in the prophetic uh, callings, frequently you see this kind of language concerning the mouth of the prophets. We'll see something similar in the call of Jeremiah and the call of Ezekiel, where God does something with their lips or with their mouth. He's the one who prepares the mouth to do the prophecy, whether it's cleansing it or opening the lips or, or whatever it might be. In this case, the atoning or cleansing of his lips to make him worthy or to make his mouth ready to, uh, to do that, to be able to do that. Um, let's move this up just a little bit further here. Somewhere here. There we go. That's not working like that. Let's try that again. I missed the mouse. There, that'll work. Now we go to our last verse then, verse 8, and we begin with that eshlach. Um, this uh, particular this particular uh, verb here, you know, probably know this form, the shalak, to send. Again, this idea of sending is much more common. The idea we we tend to talk about the call of Isaiah, but actually the call of Isaiah doesn't start till verse. Well, maybe verse 8 here, everything is before, it hasn't really been part of the call, but really it's verse 9 and 9 through 13 where Isaiah receives his call. But this is the sending that we see going on here. We even use that term and usually do use that term in Old Testament literature, the idea of to send. So, um, and here becomes a very important uh, oh part of this, the umi lelech lanu. And this is where I want you to take a look. Lanu is for us. Now as it says here, who will go for us here? Well, for us has that um, kind of that idea, I mean, it's plural, has the idea of the whole Godhead again, as we see, uh, let us make man in our own image, you know, as we saw all back in Genesis. Well, here we have this, and you put this coupled with the triad of Kadosh, 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 it really does tend to show us a more Trinitarian reality taking place here. You know, one does wonder, as we close this up today, we wonder if Isaiah really knows what he's getting into when he responds or when he volunteers, here am I, send me. Would he have been so eager if he had first heard the job description that follows this in verses 9 to 13? One does really wonder. Well, God bless you as you go about your task of preaching this coming Sunday. Uh, blessings on your celebration of the Holy Trinity. Thank you.